Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Gonna wait till everyone kind of filters in here. Maybe give it another few minutes. So just uh, double check that you're in the right spot. This is the critical care uh, virtual programming session at the Mitchell Institute. So today we'll be discussing our three critical care programs, cardiovascular perfusion, respiratory therapy, and anesthesia assistant. Still see some people coming in here. Give another few minutes. I think we're slowing down with the numbers here, so I will get started. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Emma. Uh, I am the Student Recruitment Officer at the Michter Institute of Education at UHN. And today, as I mentioned, we will be going over the critical care programs at the Michter Institute, two full-time programs in cardiovascular perfusion and respiratory therapy, and then our part-time program in anesthesia assistant. So before I get started, I do want to introduce our lovely panelists that will be talking today about the programs, about the professions. Um, so to start off, I wanted to introduce our chair of the critical care programs, uh, Hasina, if you want to just quickly come out on camera and just introduce yourself, that would be lovely. Hi there, nice to meet you all. I'm Hasina Jaffer, the um, academic chair of our critical care programs here. So that's, as Emma mentioned, perfusion, respiratory therapy, and um, anesthesia assistant. Amazing. Thank you so much, Asina. And we do have um, our two respiratory, well, I guess one respiratory therapy uh, program communication liaisons, and that is Anna. So hi, Anna, lovely to see you. And then our, oh yeah, go ahead. Hi. <laughs> hi, Anna. All right. Hi. And then we also have our anesthesia assistant program communication liaison, Phoebe. Phoebe, if you want to just quickly go on camera and introduce yourself. Hi everyone, I'm Phoebe Lan. Um, I'm the uh, professor and program liaison for the anesthesia assistant program here at Mitcher. I'm, I'm also an anesthesia assistant at uh, University Health Network and the um, coordinator of the anesthesia simulation center. Hi everybody. Amazing, thank you so much Phoebe. And then we do have a program communications liaison from cardiovascular perfusion, Constantine, he will be joining us shortly after. Oh, I think he just joined. I'll give him a few minutes. <laughs> I will introduce our students in the meantime. Um, so first we have Elisa. She is representing our amazing student panel. So she is part of the, um, oh, sorry. I just cut out there for a second. Uh, Elisa, if you want to introduce yourself quickly. Oh, I think you're on mute. <laughs> oh man. Um... I'm Melissa, and I am a recent graduate from the cardiovascular perfusion program at Michener. And I'm now working at uh, University Health Network as a perfusionist. So I'm here to answer your questions. Amazing, thank you so much. And then next we have Susanna. She's representing the respiratory therapy program. So Susanna, if you want to just quickly introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Susanna. Uh, I'm a recent graduate from the respiratory therapy program, currently working at Toronto General Hospital, so not straying away too much from UHN, and I'm happy to be here and answer some questions for you guys. Amazing. Thank you so much. And then our final student, we have Peter representing anesthesia assistant. Hi there. I'm uh, Peter, one of the anesthesia assistants at the U UHN, University Health Network, and uh, graduate from uh, last year's program, and happy to talk about the profession and uh, answer any questions you have. Amazing. Thank you so much, Peter. And then, of course, we have Constantine. He's representing uh, the cardiovascular perfusion program as the program communications liaison. Hi. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, happy to be here. So ready to answer questions. Amazing. 
Okay, and that is all of our lovely panelists that we have with us today. So with that, I will get started with our content today. So I did just want to go through what the kind of structure of the session will look like. Uh, so for each of our three programs, I will be doing, we'll be doing a faculty panel, a student panel. I'll be going through the application process because it is a bit different for each of the three programs. And then we'll be ending with a live Q&A session. So before we get started with that, I did want to do a land acknowledgement with all of you. The Mister Institute is located in downtown Toronto, so we acknowledge the sacred land where we are today, which has been and continues to be the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River, among many other unnamed and unrecognized Indigenous communities. At this location, we stand on land protected by the Dish with One Spoon Treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. We recognize this agreement not as a thing of the past, but as a promise today and into the future. We must share the responsibility of ensuring that the dish is never empty by taking care of the land and the creatures we share it with and transforming our personal and institutional relationships. This meeting place is still home to many Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work and learn on this land. We urge you as future Canadian healthcare practitioners and leaders to acknowledge that it is our collective responsibility to strengthen our ties within the communities we serve and practice healthcare in a way that advances the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's seven health-related recommendations and practice your profession in that spirit. Sorry if you hear the sirens outside my apartment. Okay, and with that, I just wanted to do a quick overview of what makes Michener unique? And we like to call these five great features all part of the Michener advantage. So to start off, the Michener Institute is focused exclusively on healthcare and applied health sciences. So some other colleges that you've maybe heard of, visited, they do programs in business, programs in art. We are exclusively dedicated to the applied health sciences. So all of our programs are professions that are found in a hospital in the healthcare industry. And some of our programs are actually the only ones of their kind in Canada. So today you'll hear cardiovascular perfusion. It is actually the only master's degree in cardiovascular perfusion offered in the country. We're also very career driven. So our programs are very hands on. They're very practical. We use simulation and clinical experience to ensure the students know what it's like to work in a hospital in a healthcare setting. And actually our graduates are actually over 95% employed within six months of their graduation which is an average of 10% higher than other Ontario colleges. We're also an integral part of the healthcare system. So we're actually the only school in Canada that is completely funded by the Provincial Ministry of Health. Our curriculum is therefore informed by cutting edge research and clinical innovations. So we like to say that, you know, hospitals, healthcare industries, they know about Michener, they know how great our graduates are and what great healthcare practitioners they will become. We also have incredible quality at the Michener Institute. We offer very small class sizes. I think our largest class size is around 75 students, so much smaller than your typical college. Our faculty, you'll hear from some of them today, they're all experienced healthcare professionals, and almost all of Michener's full-time programs are accredited by Accreditation Canada. And we also have heart at the center of all that we do. We have, of course, as I said, simulated patient scenarios to prepare our students to connect and communicate deeply with patients at the most challenging time of their lives, and our graduates are among some of the most caring, skilled leaders in their fields of practice. And with that, we're going to get into our first program for today, and that is the Cardiovascular Perfusion Program. So like I said, a very popular program. It is actually the only master's program in this field offered in Canada. So to start off today, I'm going to get into our faculty panel. So that will be with our chair, Hasina, and our program communications liaison, Constantine. And they're just going to discuss kind of the profession, the program, um, what's it like to be a perfusionist, that kind of thing. So with that, I'm going to get into our very first question. So this question can be for either Constantine or Hasina. Uh, can you describe the ideal candidate for the cardiovascular perfusion program? Sure, yeah. Um, should I start off, Constantine? Sure. Okay. So I would say the ideal candidate is um, somebody who has a very strong foundation in um, science, who knows about cardi cardiology or cardiac physiology, and um, someone who has a very um, technical skill set. 
I think a lot of the role um, certainly involves troubleshooting and um, problem solving with medical equipment such as the heart lung machine. So that would certainly be a big part of the role and um, the ideal candidate would be able to, to do those types of things. Um, another part of the role is being able to function in a cardiac OR where um, you're under a high stress environment. So you're able to adapt quickly, um, you're able to respond quickly in high stressful scenarios. And um, another big, a uh, big, I guess, um, ideal role for the candidate would be to have great communication skills. So you're, you're working with an entire team in a cardiac OR. Um, there's the anesthetist, there's a cardiac surgeon, there's nurses, and um, your communication skills have to have to be great. You're constantly communicating information. Um, you have to be aware of your surroundings and changing patient environments and being able to just adapt quickly and communicate what you're doing to the entire interprofessional team. Constantine, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> that's a very good uh, segue, Hasina. Um, definitely, too, you have to, I think we're looking for candidates who have a certain level of maturity as well. Um, the situation, as Hasina alluded to, can be very stressful. Um, there's a lot of, um, we refer to it as the triad in the cardiac room. So it's uh, really the cardiac surgeon, the cardiac anesthetist, and the cardiovascular perfusionist. So the dynamic between the three key players is, is paramount. So understanding each other's roles, able to make suggestions at the appropriate time, understand the fact that any one of those three people can actually um, have a profound effect on outcome for that patient. And with that comes then a high level of responsibility for that patient. So we're really looking for candidates who have that maturity level to be able to um, function under those stressful situations. So it's, it's, it's extremely paramount that you're able to do that. So knowledge is important, but uh, how we utilize that knowledge is key. I want to just add one more thing. So um, there's also a lot of physical demands in terms of the role. Um, there's medical equipment. I don't know if you'd be the one pushing it around or, or carrying, carrying heavy equipment sometimes. Um, you're also sitting for long periods of the time during a cardiac case. So it might run for a few hours. It might run for, it might go longer, maybe up to six hours even. So in those cases, you'd be sitting in one position for quite some time. Um, and then there's your dexterity. I mean, you'd be, there's parts where you're putting circuits together and clamping things and you just really have to have good mobility and dexterity in your hands. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it is physically very demanding. Hours, uh, you take a lot of on call. So we mimic a lot of what the cardiac surgeons are doing. So there's um, a lot of on call. Um, your day can start at 7 a.m. and end the next day at 7 a.m. So you have to be prepared for that. And um, it's a lot of bending and moving and um, you're sitting for long periods of time, but the concentration level has to be very high for long periods of time. And that really tires you. So just those are the kind of things that we have to be physically strong as well not it's not just a mental you know so mentally physically we have to be prepared yeah okay and i think you both kind of segued into the next question um which are what are some of the soft skills required for these professions i think you mentioned uh, a few of them any other ones you'd say um you know you really have to have a uh, uh, empathy for the patient not sympathy you have to empathize. You have to understand what they're going through, how they're feeling. They're very vulnerable. And we do interact quite a bit with the patient. So it's important to be able to do that, is have real empathy for them. And 
it's 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 not it can't just be empty words we have to live it so uh, those things uh, working with people who are very demanding you know they're asking a lot of us all the time and uh, we often say we're only as good as the last case so you know um and there's no room for error so you know you have to be able to kind of absorb that one thing I would just add is that um, many cardiac centers take on a lot of students. So once you're a practicing perfusionist, um, you likely would have a student alongside with you. So you would just have to have the ability to, or you would have to feel comfortable giving feedback and um, guiding learners, not just perfusionists, but other professionals along sure, the way. Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much for those answers. Emma. Okay, uh, so moving on to our third question. Um, so where do garages of this program typically work? Yeah, so I would say, um, sorry, Constantine, did you want to go first or? No, 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 go ahead. So I would say um, the majority of perfusionists would work in a cardiac OR. Um, across the globe, perfusionists are needed for almost every single cardiac surgery case. But um, outside of that, I would say the role is certainly growing within the areas of ICUs and cath labs where perfusionists come out of the OR and they would run the ECMO or ECLS in those environments. Um, and, addition, and in addition to that clinical role, their perfusionists are also heavily involved in research initiatives, um, quality improvement initiatives, and of course, education as well. Yeah. Definitely. I think uh, Hasina hit it on the head there. So it's very multifaceted. Uh, but keep in mind, cardiac um, hospitals that do cardiac surgery are more limited than general hospitals. So where you would work would be basically centers that do cardiac surgery. So for example, in the GTA, we have several hospitals, but as we move further and further out, there's less opportunities. Okay. Makes sense. One other area I just thought of um, is the role in sales and services. So I've seen many perfusionists move on to um, work for medical equipment companies. So they would they would be involved in sales and services. They would take these new pieces of equipment to hospitals or schools. Um, and sell them. And in that role, they would also work as educators. So you would teach clinicians about the technologies and what's new in the field. And that's certainly an area that you could go into in the future. Yeah. Great, thank you so much. Okay, and our final question for the two of you is, uh, can you just briefly describe what a day in the life of a perfusionist would look like? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll, leave, I'll leave this one to Constantine. I, I'm not a perfusionist by profession. I'm a respiratory therapist. So Constantine yeah. would definitely be the best one to answer this. They're uh, very long days, usually uh, 10 to 12 hours. Uh, we start very early in the morning because obviously we got to be there before the patient. So typically our day starts at 7 a.m., maybe sooner. Uh, earlier. Um, the day would entail coming to the OR that early, making sure you have everything you need. You would set up the heart-lung machine. Uh, you would set up any ancillary devices you have, get ready for possibly having a student, so there's teaching involved. Um, we would, of course, prepare everything we need, the chart, everything we need uh, for the surgery. Then we would have a, a patient would come in the room, we'd have a briefing with the surgeon and the anesthetist and the nurses in the room. What's the procedure? What are we doing? Uh, what do we expect? What is desired from us? What is desired from anesthesia, from surgery? And then we all come together to have a plan for that patient. So that's just the one patient, the first case of the day. If you're lucky, you could maybe get a coffee, <laughs> but typically we don't. We have our breakfast before we show up to the operating room um, and we would uh, begin the procedure. So I won't bore you with all the details, but then if you're lucky, you could have a lunch. 
uh, once the lunch is over, you're going to come back and hopefully one of your colleagues is helping you and we can set up for the next case. So typically we do one to two procedures a day. One procedure could last, as Hasina said, anywhere between on average four to six hours. So you may do two of those procedures in a day if you're with a, a less complicated procedure. So roughly around 6 p.m., we would be out of the door for that day, unless I'm on call. If we're on call, we could have to stay, depending if there's an emergency work, or if we get called back in the middle of the night, and we would stay till the next day. So it, it can be a very long day, and it can be a very intense day. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much, Constantine. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So that wraps up the questions that we had for faculty about the cardiovascular perfusion program. I see people already putting their questions in the chat or in the Q&A, that's amazing. Um, we will try to answer as many as we can after we go through the content in the panels. Um, so with that, I'm going to move on to the student panel today. So we have Elisa with us. She is a graduate, or she yeah, graduate from the cardiovascular perfusion program. So she is kind of the expert on what a student in this program you know, the experience for that student would be. Um, so, Elisa, I did want to just kind of ask you a few questions regarding the student experience, um, the classes that you took at Michener. Uh, so just to start off, um, so why did you choose the cardiovascular perfusion program? Um, so for me personally, my background is a foreign trained physician, which is one of the avenues that you can use to get into the program. Um, again, you know, those of you that are thinking of applying, I'm sure have looked into the different avenues you can take to apply. That's my background. Uh, I've also done a lot of research in cardiovascular health and disease. And so to me, it was um, a great opportunity to be able to do clinical work within the, you know, cardiovascular disease um, area, as well as be able to participate in clinical research, which is a for me, an important part of my practice. So looking into it that, you know, to me, it made sense to, to go down this avenue. Amazing. Thank you so much, Lisa. Okay. And our second question for you is, um, can you tell us about like maybe a favorite course you had at Michener or maybe like something cool you got to do in one of your courses, anything that you think would be cool to share with us? Yeah, I think all the courses are very, very interesting. They're very uh, they're very clinical. So, you know, you are learning a lot of medical courses. So you have anatomy and physiology and pharmacology and, you know, hemotherapy and um, hematology. So they're all very clinically based. So if that's something you enjoy, that's something you're going to enjoy. I did. And so to me, all of the courses were very relevant and very interesting to learn. Um, I think you know, you had mentioned earlier that one of the cool things about Michener is you do a lot of hands-on things and a lot of simulations. So I thought those were pretty amazing at Michener. Um, we have lab classes where we actually set up circuits. We actually run mock cases. We troubleshoot. We do unusual situations. Um, there are multiple labs and spaces to do that. So we have a specific simulation course that is set up as an OR, um, one of your instructors will be your surgeon, you will be the perfusionist. These cases get recorded on video. Um, you are able to see them, your classmates are able to see them. We have a viewing gallery behind a mirror that you're able to watch this through. So it's very hands-on, very involved. Um, so to me, that was, an amazing way to learn to really feel like you're in the environment you're going to be working on to really run through the cases and any emergencies and unusual situations you may encounter or usual situations that are quite difficult. Um, so I think that was a very neat course. The fact that we got to really feel, you know, be in school, but really feel like we're in the clinical setting we'll be working in. So I think the simulation course was definitely a highlight for most of my classmates and I. 
Amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really want to highlight the uh, the simulation and the the application yeah. that the missioner has. Yeah, it's definitely a huge, as I said, a huge missioner advantage. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. So our final question for you today is um, just in general, what was it like being a student at Mission? Like, did, would you have any like cool, like what was it like living in Toronto? Did you like any events, any clubs, anything like that? Um, you know, I think I, I'm probably an odd um, example of that because unfortunately I went through the program during COVID time. So, you know, there's life before COVID and after, and my classmates and I went through a slightly adjusted, unorthodox COVID experience. Um, so I would say we didn't get to do as many social activities by far as classes before us did, um, which was unfortunate. On the flip side, like you said, the classes are small. Cardiovascular perfusion specifically is quite a small program. So we all got very close and you really get to know your classmates. You do a lot of um, projects and activities that are group uh, in group settings, you know, in a safe COVID way. And um, so you really get to know your classmates and the simulations you run and the lab work you do is very, um, very much a team setting, you know, where you all play different roles for each other in terms of being the surgeon, the patient, the, and the anesthesiologist, the perfusionist. And so you really get to know one another well, and you really get to, you know, help each other and uh, participate in each other's learning. And I really, you know, my classmates are the loveliest people, and I really got close to them. And I think that was a highlight for me, that it was a small class, that we all really had to work together um, every day. And, and that that allowed you to learn in a, in a much more dynamic setting. So I think that was a highlight. Um, again, I can't quite comment on too many social events because it was just a no-go at that point. Um, but we had a great time regardless, just because we had to work so much together. Amazing, thank you so much, Lisa. Okay, and that wraps up our cardiovascular perfusion content. So thank you so much to the faculty, to our incredible alumni for participating in that. Um, so we do, I see a bunch of questions. Uh, we will be doing a live Q&A at the end. So I have all the questions saved. So don't worry about that. I will try, I'll try to answer the ones that I can just in the chat box typed out, but then for the job specific ones, we'll get to those at the end. Okay, and with that, we're going to move on to the perfusion uh, application process. So we've heard from our amazing faculty, amazing students. So the cardiovascular perfusion application process consists of five steps. So number one, uh, obviously, make sure you review the admission requirements, see if you are eligible for admission. I saw a few questions about admission requirements. Um, all of that information is posted on our website. We can't go through all of the uh, um, requirements in detail today. It would take way too long. Um, but yeah, you can find all that information on our website, as well as the supporting documents, make sure you prepare those um, stuff like, you know, transcripts, reference letters, make sure you have all those prepared, ready to go. Third would be to apply via our Michener self-service portal. So the application fee for that is $135. That deadline is February 1st of 2023. The fourth would be to register and complete our CASPER assessment. That is a online computer-based assessment. You'd have to register at Take Altus using your nine-digit Michener ID you get after you apply via self-service. And then finally, of course, submit your supporting documents with your application. That deadline is February 8th of 2023. And with that, we're going to move on to our second critical care program, which is the respiratory therapy program. So uh, you all know the drill. We've done it once already. We're going to start with our discussion with chairs and faculty. So we have the lovely Anna, as well as Hasina, who's already done some great stuff with us for CVP. Um, but I will give the floor to them for our four faculty questions. So the first question that we had regarding respiratory therapy was, can you describe the ideal candidate for the respiratory therapy program? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I'll start. So um, I would say it's very similar to perfusion. It would be somebody who would come from a science background, someone who's genuinely interested in, um, in healthcare and treating patients. And the role is quite unique in that it's, um, I would say it's a blend of providing direct patient care as well as managing a lot of um, medical technologies and technical equipment such as ventilators and airway equipment. So you would also have to be very technical in that sense. 
um, a lot of our, our students come from either high school or university. And um, I would say the majority probably already have an undergrad, but we do certainly have those that come from, from high school. As long as you have a strong science foundation, um, I think that's what really matters in being successful in the program. Um, in terms of um, being technical, you should also be a very good problem solver, be able to troubleshoot medical equipment. Um, and similarly to perfusion, I would say the role is quite high stress. So you'd be working in um, the emergency department, the intensive care unit. So just being able to be adaptable, think critically on your feet um, and be able to perhaps change your care plan or your your method of doing something very quickly based on the patient's clinical status. I don't know if we have Anna here with us. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm here. I've been here. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I have to say that uh, we have to be adaptable. We talk to all the healthcare providers that work in an ICU, a critical care emergency room. We have to be able to talk to our not only our patients, but also um, even the family members that are with them. We see end of life. We see start of life. We go to high risk deliveries. We see the little, little babies. Uh, we see uh, the babies that are not breathing so well. Uh, we see people at every stage of their life. So you do have to be very, very adaptable. Um, also mature, um, probably not as mature as CVP program, but certainly you have to be mature enough to handle kind of the, the be able to communicate in some of these delicate situations. Definitely having empathy. I heard Constantine say that uh, for his program, definitely all our programs for that matter. You have to have empathy to be able to speak to our patients and be able to manipulate um, ventilators, uh, equipment, be able to show, handle, you know, <laughs> demonstrate uh, some of the equipment we deal with. We're definitely equipment junkies. Uh, definitely, we like that. Um, so that would be an ideal candidate and open to learning and experiences. Definitely. Uh, taking every opportunity, every patient, every opportunity to learn. I mean, look what happened with COVID, right? Like we learned right away um, what there is to do, right? And we were the first in line uh, to treat those patients. So certainly we're still adapting and continue to adapt in this pandemic. So, and as first responders uh, with that. Uh, so I think that's it. And I, I love that you had an arrow chamber and a stethoscope readily oh, available. So Amazing. <laughs> yeah. So awesome. The other Anna came would, prepared with props. Yeah. <laughs> it. The other thing I would highlight is um, like I would describe ourselves as the paramedics of the hospital. So you're really rushing to every single emergency that happens. So for 12 hours, you'd be on your feet. Um, you'd have to, you'd be pushing and lifting heavy equipment. You might be lifting patients. Um, you might be running from labor and delivery to the emergency room, which is on the opposite end of the hospital, to suddenly to the ICU, which might be in another area of the hospital. So you're just on your feet quite quite a bit. Amazing. Thank you so much. Okay, so our next question for the two of you is, um, you've kind of briefly touched on this again, like with CVP, uh, but what soft skills are required for this profession? So any that maybe you wanted to talk a bit more about or that you missed? Yeah, um, sure. I can, I can start off with, um, I think, communication. We touched upon it a little bit, but um, having good communication skills is, is really important. You're providing a report to the next respiratory therapist coming on shift, and um, you'd be able, you have to be able to provide detailed information in terms of your patient status and how they're doing. Um, you'd also participate at RAM, so you'd, you'd have to communicate with the interprofessional team in terms of your care plan and your assessments, um, or if you're, sometimes you might be advocating for a patient. And um, with that also comes having the ability to have those difficult conversations with patients and their families, because we really do treat patients when they're at their most vulnerable. So just being able to share that, you know, tomorrow might be the day where we're taking them off of life support, or maybe it's the opposite. It's a, it's a good thing saying, hey, we're taking them off and now they're breathing on their own. 
or perhaps we're taking them off and they might be passing away soon. Um, so being able to have those types of conversations, I would say, is, is crucial. Um, Anna, can you think of any other soft skills that would be ideal for a candidate to have? No, all the ones that you said, plus being adaptable to change, be uh, to educate people, um, just like what uh, Hestina mentioned, that um, every kind of uh, opportunity that you have to discuss with patients about what you're doing with them, what the next steps are, definitely require high level of communication in urgent situations as well. Uh, so very quick on your feet, uh, have to be able to uh, be very adaptable, I think is another kind of soft skill um, that we are notorious for having, especially if that equipment goes awry. We, we typically are the equipment junkies as well as the soft skills about talking about the equipment and making sure it's operational. Amazing. Thank you so much. All right. So our third question for today is, uh, so where can graduates of this program typically work? Yeah, I would say there's a ton of areas where graduates can work. Um, the bulk of our graduates do go on to work in acute care environments in a hospital. And they work in areas such as labor and delivery, the neonatal intensive care unit, adult intensive care units. You might help out um, on inpatient floors in the emergency department. So it's really rotating around a variety of different areas in the hospital. Um, outside of an acute care environment, RTs, the role of an RT is really growing in the community setting. So you might work with a CPAP company where you help patients with an apparatus that they wear for sleep if they have something called obstructive sleep apnea. You might work in home oxygen. Um, you might work with a family health team. You might work in clinics such as pulmonary rehab or cystic fibrosis or an ALS clinic. Um, I would say there's also a role within smoking cessation clinics or things like the, or clinics that offer that service. Um, and outside of that, Sometimes people get involved in a lot of research, so you could be a part of research teams, quality improvement initiatives, um, what else? Oh, education, that one's huge. So either patient education or um, being an educator for students and in an academic environment. Do anything else that you can think of, Anna? Yes, sales. sales uh, so yeah. sales and diagnostic areas. So sales, anybody could go into sales. Again, education is one of the pivotal things that we do as, as respiratory therapists or RTs, as we call ourselves. And we're now being considered kind of uh, forerunners for even coordinating uh, care for some of our patients requiring long uh, care uh, and access to care, respiratory care in the community. Um, and certainly that's an area of growth, I think, for the future of our career. But definitely there's lots of jobs out there. Definitely uh, lots. Or you might even choose to continue your career. I mean, from respiratory therapy, you can go into perfusion. You can go into anesthesia assistance. Um, a lot of my colleagues have actually gone into infection control and become an infection control practitioner. And I think there is one particular school that offers um, admissions to respiratory therapists to become an infection control practitioner. So that could be an area. Amazing. Thank you so much. All right. And I've, our final question for the two of you today is, can you just briefly describe what a day in the life of a respiratory therapist would look like? Anna, do you want to wow. start? <laughs> Are you going to start off this one, Hasina? <laughs> you start this one. <laughs> okay. So really the typical day for an RT depends on what they decide to do. Now, it, most people will go into acute care environments. So they're getting report early in the morning, just like what uh, Constantine mentioned about anesthesia or about CVP or perfusion, it's that we're carrying over the care from the night people into the daytime. So getting report, uh, getting a focused uh, chart uh, or system of, of things that we do with our patients, 
typically require us to uh, go around the unit, making sure that patients are at their level of care, maximized for their care. Are they on the optimal ventilation parameters? Uh, seeing if they qualify to re be removed off life support or need other uh, certain um, aspects to their care. Uh, we are also involved in transporting patients to some uh, other areas of the hospital. So if they need an MRI, for instance, or if they have to go on transfer to go and have another procedure done in another area of the hospital, especially if they're ventilated, that is, uh, is something that we're typically uh, involved in very much so, right? Because we're at the airway, the, the front of the patient. So transferring the patient, making sure they get there correctly, uh, if they need any other specialized tests and care items. Uh, we also can work, uh, for instance, in all areas of the hospital. So not only do we actually spend time in ICU, we can also rotate into, uh, for instance, emergency care room. If uh, emergencies, people come in not being able to breathe, we also go there. The wards, if there's patients who have uh, airways in, artificial airways, we take care of that. Uh, we uh, remove secretions down their lungs to help them breathe. We give medications. We listen to their breathing. Uh, we actually have oxygen. We include oxygen. Uh, and even on discharge, so even when the patient is all fully good, if they are able to leave the hospital, we're involved in the care and planning of their home therapies, their home medications, and all the things that they would need in their home uh, for their care in the home on discharge. And that might involve even talking to family members around some of the interventions that we provide. Um, and, and if we get a lunch and a drink and a break, um, we hope to. Otherwise, we do uh, provide 24. There's usually most hospitals in the uh, vicinity have 24 hour coverage for respiratory therapists to be able to cover for all the acute cases coming in, all of the patients who can't breathe that, and we're part of the cardiac arrest team, rapid response team, every team, right? High risk delivery team, code pink team, code blue team. Uh, so a lot of things that we do, uh, and it could really go anywhere on a busy day, the care is everywhere uh, for anybody who can't breathe. So that's the, that's, that's me in a day. And I think you did an amazing job. I don't know if I have anything else left to say. Um, in terms of the hours, so you did mention that we run 24 hours. Um, I think it would be a, a lot of 12 hour shifts at most places. So you would do 12 hour days or 12 hour nights. Um, some hospitals also have on call for RTs for emergency cases at night, um, if you were to work in an OR setting. And um, in terms of other teams, so Anna mentioned um, the cardiac arrest team. There's also trauma teams that RTs are a part of, um, trach teams that RTs are a part of. So just a lot of, yeah, a lot of opportunity to get into like different parts of the hospital and you're, you're pretty much touching every area, inpatient and outpatient areas. All right, thank you so much, Anna and Hasina. Uh, the sirens outside my apartment are so loud, so apologies if you hear that. Uh, but thank you for those great insights into the respiratory therapy program. Um, so now we're going to hear from uh, Susanna. She is a respiratory therapy student at Michener. Um, she's actually here for last year's virtual programming, so she has a great contribution to our events uh, at the Michener Institute. Okay, um, so Susan, if you're ready, I did want to start off with our first question for you, and that is, uh, why did you choose the respiratory therapy program? Um, hi. hi. Um, so yeah, I am a recent grad, not a student anymore. Um, but yeah, I chose the program because of how involved it is in patient care. Like Anna and Hasina summarized, we're very involved, different parts of the hospital, different patient demographics. And within the role, you have a lot of versatility and there's a lot of autonomy. Um, and that's what first drew me into applying to the RT program at Michener. Um, we're also very involved at the bedside with patient care, but also within the community. It's not just um, healthcare either. I have uh, colleagues that started working in pharmaceuticals and colleagues that are currently working in the Ministry of Health. So within RT, it doesn't have your final destination. It didn't have to be a hospital. It could also be a community setting if 12 hour days didn't work for you. So uh, just the versatility within it and the many options that the role provided attracted me to the program. Um, 
also you have lots of education uh, and an example of that is uh, uh, like um, patients that you need to educate that have COPD or um, just um, patients that are going home with medical devices that provide oxygen or medical devices that help them breathe like uh, the tracheostomy tube, the artificial airway. So there's a lot of opportunities to educate, but also uh, be at the bedside. And the way that the program itself can act as a segue to adjacent careers, uh, like AA or CVP, that was also interesting because it didn't mean uh, you had to stop at being an RT. You could also grow within the profession and outside the profession. And I really like that as well. And I think Lucy's here with us and she can provide some insight. She's a current student too. Oh, hi, Lucy. Hello, hello, guys. Hello. Yeah, did you want to add anything about uh, why you chose the respiratory therapy program? I think I agree uh, with Susanna, what she said. Uh, for me, how I chose this program, it was, um, I saw lots of hands-on experience when I was talking to my friend, she was already in this program. She said, like, you are hands-on with this patient. And I feel like I enjoyed that more than research or anything. So, uh, and it was more like the courses that I'm going to speak about later as well. It's more like physiology involving, and I feel like I enjoy learning like physiology about the like human body and stuff. So definitely like I heard good things about the program. That's why I accepted the offer and I'm happily now currently at my West Park rotation, just sitting here, which is like a rehab center for patients with like COPD lung conditions. So, uh, yeah. Amazing, thank you both so much. And I think Lucy kind of segued into our next question, uh, which is, can you tell us about some of your courses? So if you wanna tell us like maybe your favorite course or something interesting that you saw or did in one of your courses. Sure, so uh, we, start, we start with some like uh, basic thing, oxygen cylinders. We learned about like the big tanks of uh, gases. We cover some uh, anatomy and physiology of the human body, especially like focus on the uh, respiratory system, lung dynamics. We also take some pharmacology courses, especially the medications that are related to like, to, like breathing, uh, the medications that help people breathe better. We do some diagnostic uh, courses. So we take some ECG as well as some um, like lung tests, uh, how we do lung tests and how uh, we write report, like some te technology things. We also uh, focus um, a lot on ventilators. So different modes in the ventilators and different settings and what to change uh, based on what we see from the blood gases. Um, we also take courses like um, just to get to know like the equipment that we use, like airway equipment. So for example, the tubes that we, we want to intubate patients or like oxygen tubings and uh, some uh, equipment that we use to deliver medications to the patients. Uh, also, we learn about uh, as Anna was mentioning, home oxygen and how they work, uh, the funding and how we um, assess patients if they're qualified for home oxygen in Ontario. And then we do summer simulation courses at the end of the second year to prepare us uh, before we go to our clinical rotation, which is the third year, which I'm in the third year now doing my clinical rotations. A favorite course that like I, I don't I think I enjoyed every uh, I enjoyed um, the courses, especially like the ventilators, because you learn so much about the ventilators and you are the specialist when you go out there. So sometimes doctors wouldn't have that deep of a knowledge of the ventilators and then they come to you and ask a question about the ventilator. So I found that like my knowledge from the courses is really valuable when other team like uh, healthcare team members ask me so I can answer based on my knowledge. So I would say that is my favorite part. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, Suzanne, I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to add, but if not, that's totally cool. I can move on to the final question. Yeah, no, uh, I can add. I definitely agree with Lucy. I think um, ventilation and management of uh, the breathing machine is 40% of what we do. 
So the courses, I think that were taught at Michener did a really good job at providing that uh, foundational uh, knowledge that you need uh, when you go into the field. But also just looking retrospectively uh, as a graduate, I think the courses at Michener did provide a very holistic sense of what you experience in the field. Um, they teach you about the different demographics, NICU, about the babies, about the kids, about adults, and how the OR environment looks like. And I think that's, it provides a very holistic view of what we do. Uh, once you go into the field, it might not necessarily be that you're dealing with all these demographics, but it definitely gives you the knowledge that you need for that critical thinking when you experience those demographics in, a, in the field. Amazing, thank you so much. All right, so our final question for the two of you, or either one, doesn't matter. Um, so what's it like being a student at Michener? I can talk some things and Susanna can add later. Being a student at Michener, for me, it was during um, like, like online Corona times, right? But still Michener, like uh, Michener did a good job like organizing some things. For example, um, just past like this September or October, I went on a boat cruise. So they organized like, so they tried to like, you know, do some certain things. So I definitely enjoyed the boat cruise they did. Um, there is a gym there you can use. Um, what else? Like uh, they, they try to organize some uh, events like a pub night that's coming. You know, there is there is lots of social events that uh, you can go. Uh, I, and I feel like if it wasn't COVID during my study times, it would have been uh, more of these events. But yeah, definitely some some events to get excited year round, not just study study. There is also like the social aspect there of being a student. Amazing. Yeah, uh, and I can add on to that. Um, so I had the unique experience of experiencing or being a student at Michener both in person and online uh, because mine was the first year that transitioned to online in March. Uh, so being in person and being online, um, the transition was rough, but I think it was rough on the entire province. Uh, and it was definitely a hurdle that we overcame. And it was, I think we did it with as much grace as we can. Um, being in person, yes, we did have these uh, in-person events and stu the student council was very involved. And I was lucky enough to be on student council, both um, as, a, as a class rep and as uh, the, the president of student council during my second year. And we do have a lot of involvement. We do get uh, reps for each program and we try to involve the entire class uh, for things like tomorrow we're actually having an alumni meet and greet for the respiratory therapy students uh, where we've arranged uh, the RT program to meet with some of the alumni that we have uh, working in the field so that they can ask questions and these are some of the events that we try to work out online so that we can they can uh, anybody from anywhere can join so it caters to the, however long it takes you to commute, it would eliminate that. And then we also had online uh, in-person events. So we did have the boat cruise. We had a Blue Jays game and our frost week is usually in person. Um, so all of these things, we do try to elevate the student experience because we do know that these program, uh, programs are hard and we try to create that sense of community for the students uh, because we're all in it together. Um, so yeah, I, I really liked my student experience at Michener. I'm a huge advocate. I, I wanted to add something now I remember when you were talking so uh, there is also the student success network so they're there to help you like uh, for example I took a course and um, it they helped me like uh, organize my thoughts how to communicate my feelings to other people and it, it can be like helpful when you're working in an interprofessional like healthcare team so they uh, they offer course like uh, courses like four or five times like classes and also they can help you with the assignments if you're having difficulty like writing or like need somebody to look over your like whatever you're writing so that's a resource too amazing yeah, and to, oh, yeah, oh, and yeah. to add no, on to that <laughs> Um, I think uh, we, with student council and SSN, we had uh, mental health first aid courses and things that students um, 
could do or courses that they could take if there was um, um, courses on soft skills, like uh, how to assert yourself. So there are adjacent courses that you can take not only to improve or work on your knowledge base, but also those soft skills. So yeah, that was my piece. Great. Thank you so much, Susanna and Lucy. That was incredible. Okay, so that wraps up our panels for the respiratory therapy program. Just going to quickly go over the application process for this program. It's similar to cardiovascular perfusion, but not exactly the same. Um, so the first two steps, exactly the same. Review the admission requirements, prepare your supporting documents. Then you're going to apply through the Ontario College application system instead of our Michener self-service. The deadline is the same, February the 1st. The application and supplemental fees combined to make $165 for the total fee. Then you're also going to register and complete the CASPER, same with CVP. You register for that at Take Altus using the nine-digit OCAS application number you get when you apply through that portal. And then finally, of course, submit your supporting documents, of course, to OCAS, and that deadline is February 8th of 2023. And with that, we're going to move on to our final program, which is the Anesthesia Assistant Program. So unlike the first two programs, this is a part-time program. So we have, of course, our lovely Casino, who has been helping us out so far. And we're introducing Phoebe, who is the PCL for the Anesthesia Assistant Program. So um, turning over to these two lovely ladies, uh, can you describe the ideal candidate for the Anesthesia Assistant Program? Sure, yeah, absolutely. I'll start. Um, so the anesthesia assistant program is um, a postgraduate program, and it's a part-time program. So the ideal candidate would be somebody who's already a registered respiratory therapist or a registered nurse who has been working in a critical care environment and has a recent critical care experience. So what we're looking for is um, somebody who has at least 4,000 hours. and um, in terms of their, their background, they should already know how to interpret ABGs. Um, they should already know how to interpret ECGs because these are things that we don't teach in the program, but it's expected that they have that strong knowledge base. Um, they would also have to have a strong understanding of um, mechanical ventilation, monitoring a patient's hemodynamic status, and um, great technical skills and troubleshooting skills. And um, I'll get Phoebe to turn her camera on and, and join me in answering this question. Um, yeah, absolutely. I agree with uh, what uh, Hasina just said. Um, other than the skills, I think definitely with um, able to critical think, um, problem solve right, you know, right at, at that moment, uh, interp uh, interpersonal skills to help patients get through the anxiety of um, surgery. Um, anesthesia and possibly pain, um, able to collaborate with the uh, other other members of the uh, of our team. Like we are a member of our anesthesia care team, so um, we need individual that can uh, can can work in a team environment, and definitely a ability to work in a very demanding, fast paced, high stress environment. Amazing! Thank you so much, both of you. Okay, so our second question for the two of you is, uh, in general, just what soft skills are required for this profession? So again, um, somebody who has great communication skills, I would describe an AA as um, the person who's the eyes and ears for the anesthesiologist. You're really looking out for the patient, you're managing their hemodynamic status, you're, you're managing their airway. Um, you have to have situational awareness of what's happening in the entire OR or the scenario if you're working outside of an OR setting. Um, there's always stressful scenarios, as Phoebe mentioned, and um, high-risk scenarios, so just being able to adapt quickly and um, having a strong knowledge base of algorithms and protocols in those high-stress scenarios and just being able to, I guess, be calm and think through them quickly, but acting quickly at the same time. I don't know, Phoebe, if there's anything else you want you want to add to that. Yeah, I guess the, the other thing that came to mind is uh, vigilance and really attention to detail, everything that we do. Um, make sure that we give the right medication, right dosage um, at the right time, 
um, it's so important with our communication skills, right? We're able to use appropriate language because you know we'll be asking patient history and our whole anesthetic plan, depending on what type of uh, information you get from the patient. And it's very important that we're able to use appropriate language um, to be able to, to gather the information. Um, and then I think um, mention about being adaptable because like we can have plan A, but then at the end we're going to our plan B, C, D, E, F. Um, also be um, compassionate and, and uh, empathetic because like all our patients are, have, uh, it's understandable, very anxious um, for there to be doing their surgical procedures. And our compassion and empathy really help ease them, uh, ease their um, anxiety. And then um, and be curious, I think it's very important to, to, um, to be a lifelong learner, to keep on um, thinking what we can do better for our patients. I think that's, that's a good one, Phoebe, being curious and being a lifelong learner. Um, the other thing I would say is um, being a team player, just um, having the courage to speak up and advocate for your patients, or if you notice something might be a risk or might lead to a critical injury or a critical event, just being able to speak up in those scenarios and just mitigating those risks. Um, I did cut you off, Phoebe. Sorry, you, you were saying something else. No, no, that's 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 perfect. That's perfect. Amazing. Thank you so much. All right, so our next question for the two of you is, um, where can graduates of this program typically work? So I would say um, a bulk of the graduates probably would work in a hospital in um, an OR setting, but there's anesthesia assistants also work outside of the OR because there is a need for procedural sedation or sedation to occur outside of an OR setting in a hospital. Um, they also work out in um, community clinics, so a dental clinic or any clinic that would involve an anesthesiologist where they would give, um, give sedation and, and in like an outpatient procedure type of area. And then um, in the hospital, many AAs get involved in research and quality improvement. Um, they're definitely involved in student education and not just of AAs, but also of RTs, nurses, um, other physicians. They do a lot of teaching in the OR setting. And again, I would say the role of sales, um, getting involved in working for um, a medical technology or equipment company and um, being their ambassadors, selling that equipment and teaching other clinicians at schools or hospitals or other sites about new technologies that are emerging. Yeah, I just so, want to elaborate about the... Um, the outside the OR, yes, the, we, that's kind of like the trend right now. Like uh, we're moving, there are more um, outside areas that are actually asking for help from the AA because we did such a good job with our conscious sedation. <laughs> so um, yeah, so like, you know, we're talking about like cath lab, endoscopy suite, basically anywhere in the hospital that um, will, will give better patient care with better conscious sedation. Um, we need an AA. So um, this is an area that I see a, a, a extremely growth uh, recently. So uh, obviously in the OR, but um, also outside the OR. And regarding to clinics, I uh, just want to add um, stress that like we won't be able to just provide anesthesia care as an AA. We have to be working with anesthesiologists. So the anesthesiologist needs to be on site uh, at the clinic and immediately available. Just want to add that to be clear. Yeah, that is an important point. Um, there should be an anesthesiologist readily available. And sometimes I believe you would work off of medical directives, but you would always have an anesthesiologist there with you to support you. Um, and I Amazing. think that's it for areas. I can't think of any, <laughs> any other areas of practice. I think we pretty much cover it all. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. All right, so our final question for tonight for the anesthesia assistant is just, can you briefly describe what a day in the life of this profession would look like? Um, 
I, it really depends on where uh, where you're working that day. Obviously, um, you know, in the OR, outside the OR, whether you're doing a general anesthesia case or a regional anesthesia case or a conscious sedation case. But overall, um, the day will be first, we're going to take a look at the OR list to see, you know, where you booked at, what type of cases you, you're assigned to, how many patients you have, have a kind of a ballpark of what your, 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 your day will be. Then we go to the um, pre-operative care unit to, to, take a, to, to meet our patients. So during that meet, we might be um, doing a patient history. As I said before, you know, ask the patients some of their medical history, the allergies they have, you know, what type of medications they are. Um, they're taking, have they been eat, eating anything since midnight, you know, things like that. And then from those questions, then we develop an anesthetic plan. And then we prepare the equipment in the operating room. So depending on what the cases are, um, we'll prepare the, the drugs, uh, different doses of drugs, um, getting the appropriate airway equipment. Um, we might need uh, other equipment, like if it's a difficult airway, we need to get difficult airway equipment. If the patients require more hemodynamic monitoring, we have to get that ready, um, make sure our gas machine is working properly, uh, making sure you know if, if the procedure asks for blood, we make sure that uh, we have blood on, on demand. And then once the patients arrive in the operating room, we have to make sure get the patients comfortable in the, uh, the OR bed um, and then uh, put on all the monitors like ECG, set probe, uh, blood pressure cuff, and then we start to give some oxygen. And then once the whole surgical team is ready, uh, we do a timeout and then we start giving some drugs, whether it is a conscious sedation, uh, conscious sedation, uh, sedation dosage or um, general anesthesia dosage. And, and then we start the procedure and we'll be staying there with the patients for the whole procedure. And then till the end, once the surgery is done, we'll transfer the patient to um, the post anesthetic care unit. And then we report um, to our lovely nurses at, uh, in the area. And then we go and start again. And we go to meet our next patient in the preoperative uh, pre care unit. That's pretty much uh, the day. Um, in terms of hours of work, some hospitals have eight hour shifts, some have 10, some have 12. Um, there might also be some on call on nights and weekends if an AA is in-house um, scheduled during those hours. I guess different organizations have different setups, but there is definitely the possibility of being called in. Um, and I think that's it. I think we covered everything, Phoebe. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. <laughs> That was a very thorough schedule summary. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, great. And that concludes our faculty panel for anesthesia assistant and actually our faculty panels for everything. So thank you so much to all the faculty members. Um, I see you answering questions in the q and uh, Thank you for those great answers. Um, and we're going to move on to our final student panel. I'm gonna to try to kind of breeze through this because we are past time, but uh, yeah. So I'd like to welcome Peter uh, from the anesthesia assistant program. Um, so, Peter, whenever you are ready, uh, if you'd like to tell us why you chose the Anesthesia Assistant Program. Absolutely. Hi, everybody. My name is Peter. I'm one of the uh, st students from last year's class and currently an employee at the University Health Network as an anesthesia assistant. So I chose this program because uh, my background being a critical care RT, I wanted to expand my knowledge and uh, scope of practice and uh, skill set. And I, I worked with some great anesthesia assistants in the operating room, and I found that um, they really had a strong foundational knowledge built from their critical care experience and just took it to the next level. So um, I wanted to challenge myself. I wanted to be in a role and uh, a program that really not only challenged my uh, cognitive abilities, my abilities to uh, think through problems and uh, learn about human physiology and pharmacology and pathologies, but uh, my clinical skills, so airway management, mechanical ventilation, and things like that. So as an RT, or I work with a lot of RNs as well, if you want to keep challenging your critical care knowledge and skill set, the anesthesia assistant program is fantastic, as well as the, um, the job market's great. It's an expanding profession, so I wanted to be in, in, a, in a role that had continued forward growth uh, throughout my career. Amazing. Thank you so much, Peter. 
So our second question for you is, uh, can you tell us a bit about maybe like one of your favorite courses or something cool that you learned in one of your courses? Yeah, so uh, the actual uh, coursework at the UHN or at the Michener for AAs is a little bit different than a standard um, kind of course syllabus in that it's uh, it's part time and a lot of it's self directed. So uh, with being COVID as well, we uh, did a lot of online learning through the first semester um, with with weekly meetings with uh, Phoebe. Um, but the program really started to shine when we would have weekly discussions and case studies with a practicing anesthesiologist in the field. So that was really uh, enjoyable. So every week we would go through a new topic and um, being taught and uh, discussed with experts in the field. So whether it's cardiac anesthesiology, thoracic, um, pediatric from sick kids, uh, obstetrics, regional. Uh, so that I found was really enjoyable because you had uh, you were being taught by someone who was working in the field, you know, that morning or the day before who had really up-to-date knowledge and would uh, teach you the most current knowledge and where they would see, uh, you know, your, your role moving forward and uh, things like that. So the weekly discussions with the staff and just at the hospitals throughout the GTA were, was, was fantastic, as well as the uh, simulation labs. So we did quite a few simulation labs with very advanced mannequins simulating an operating room environment and you're on the spotlight and you're basically running a whole anesthetic case while uh, being you know supervised but uh you're under the spotlight by the anesthesiologist and you're going through cases and cases and scenarios to really challenge yourself and your knowledge and it really sets you up for success in the field because you've you've practiced these these situations and they they push you and so you really do challenge your skills and your knowledge throughout the simulation uh, weeks that we do at uh, the Michener. Amazing, thank you so much. And our last and final question for you today is uh, just in general, what was it like being a student at Michener? So, I, you know, again, uh, because of it being a online um, component through, through self-directed, it, it's a little bit different. So you need to have a lot of uh, self-discipline and motivation uh, to, to get through the coursework and to teach yourself and collaborate with Phoebe and the uh, anesthesiologist and contact them. So you have to be quite driven. Um, while, in a, you know, myself and all my classmates were working as well throughout this. So juggling between working in your respective job and, um, you know, schoolwork can be challenging, but again, very rewarding because what you, what you learn every day can be also applied to your job. And that's where it becomes quite successful. Um, the Michener, again, recruits all these anesthesiologists from the field who are experts in their craft. So you do learn a lot of very practical um, uh, skills and knowledge and uh, up-to-date information. And then finally, uh, the, the, as I said, Michener focuses on a lot of simulation. So they have a uh, simulation lab and that's where uh, you really truly uh, put your knowledge to the test and you learn a lot. And uh, that's, uh, we, we do, you do it multiple times you know, multiple weeks throughout your your, your year at uh, the Michener. So uh, that's, again, the best way to learn is to do things. And uh, that's where the Michener really focuses on. So it's fantastic. Amazing. Thank you so much, Peter. OK, right. so that was our final uh, question for our student of the anesthesia assistant program. Um, so with that, I'm just going to go briefly again through the application process for anesthesia assistant. Again, first two steps, exactly the same. Review the admission requirements, prepare your supporting documents. This one is also an OCAS application, so you would apply by May 31st of 2023. The application fee is also $165. And then finally, submit your supporting documents to OCAS by June 7th of 2023. And with that, um, I did, we are running short on time. I'm just gonna pick like maybe one or two questions from the Q&A that I see here. So I like this question. Um, anyone can answer this. I, I don't know who would be the best, but um, would you have any advice for someone who's trying to decide between CVP and respiratory therapy? That's, um, that's a good question. I would say if you know anyone in your networks who is either a respiratory therapist or a perfusionist, ask them questions about what their day-to-day -day work is like, what they enjoy, what their challenges are. Um, if you're the type of person who likes to be mobile and move to different areas of the hospital and um, work with patients from the time they're born up until their pediatrics to the adults to the 
to end of life care, um, respiratory therapy might be a good option for you. That being said, though, with perfusion, you can also work with with pediatrics and as well as with adults. Um, so I, I really, I really don't know how to answer that question. I guess it depends on your interests, um, your likes. The professions are are similar in that um, you're you're oxygenate, you're oxygenating patients, you're you're breathing for them when they can't do that by themselves. Um, but the environments are slightly different. So with with perfusion, you're mainly working in an OR environment. With respiratory therapy, you're in all parts of the hospital. Um, I don't know if Constantine or maybe Anna want to elaborate or, or add anything to that, but I would really explore the professions, speak to people um, in those professions. And I know in the past, prior to COVID, they used to allow you to go in and shadow for a day so you can actually learn about them and see them. But I, I'm not certain if hospitals still allow that opportunity, but you could certainly check in with them to see if it's it's an option. Anna? I definitely think it's a personal decision. I mean, I'm a little bit biased being in the respiratory therapy uh, field right now. I know Constantine was an RT first and became a CVP. So I'd be interested to hear if he had any um, recommendations. Uh, sometimes it's a first step. So we have had some students who, for instance, become a respiratory therapist, become AAs like Peter. Oh my God, congratulations, Peter. And then we have some students who are RTs and they get into CVP. Uh, so honestly, I think it's a very, um, it's a good start. Um, clearly respiratory therapy is a great field. Um, whether CVP is for you, I think you would really have to think about a day in a life. So getting an opportunity to spend some time in the OR, it's a lot more, I guess, high pressure. I mean, respiratory therapy is not without its pressures, trust me. It's just um, the OR environment is there's a lot of big people in an OR, a small area with a lot of a surgeon, nurses, perfusionists, you know, other doctors. So um, I don't know if maybe Constantine, I'm not really selling this, no, <laughs> selling your program, good. but maybe you want to talk about that. Well, I, I've been asked this question recently, actually. And for me personally, in my journey, I found being an RT very rewarding. In fact, I'm still an RT. So I was an RT for over 11, 12 years in practice and then went into perfusion. RT was definitely an asset for perfusion. I think it uh, gave me skills that allowed me to excel in perfusion. So to answer the question, that's the journey I took and I like that journey. And if I had to do it again, I would do it the same way. So it's not to say one's better or one's whatever, they're different and they can coexist in a different way. And they're both very rewarding. So I think a lot of it you have to ask yourself is, where do I want to fit in to this continuum of healthcare? Perfusion is a much lonelier job because you're kind of on your own a lot and a lot's expected of you. Whereas in respiratory, you're part of a bigger team. And, you know, they both have their advantage and disadvantage. So if you're not someone who likes to do their own thing and have everyone stare at you when things go bad, perfusion's not for you. <laughs> But if you want to work in a big team and see various run around the hospital, and there's a lot of opportunities with respiratory too. So it's all good. I think um, I look at the requirements of the program too. I know that you, obviously you could even get into respiratory therapy right out of high school. You would need very, very high marks and certainly uh, the science piece, right? Uh, which would require all of the sciences and all the maths. Um, but at the same time, uh, for especially because now uh, the program is a master's program, uh, you do require a degree. Whereas yeah. with respiratory therapy, if you don't have that, um, that it's still, you could still get into our program even though our program uh, only has 38 seats I know that that was a question that was asked uh, it's still challenging to get into especially uh, just 
after high school um, because we do like to have the maturity level, but it has been possible. I was, uh, you know, two years out. I wasn't a full grad uh, through university, um, so I was a younger graduate. And I'm an alumni, a very proud alumni of the Michener uh, many years ago. Uh, I mean, most of us are actually on this yeah. panel, which is ironic, yeah. actually. Um, so that just goes to show you that Michener programs are one of the best, and clearly we're biased. <laughs> Absolutely. Can I also add, uh, and I have zero experience with respiratory therapy, um, but we have observers that do come into UHN and they do ask this question a lot. And I know some people have said that one of the differences they find is in perfusion, you don't get as much patient interaction. I think that's fair to say. Um, yeah. I think in respiratory therapy, you get to interact with patients. In, in CVP, the patients are quite ill, typically. And, you know, it, when you do get into interact them, it's, it's brief, it's, it's very technical specialty, but you're not, you're not, you know, chatting as much with patients, because that's important to you to have that interpersonal connection and communication and conversations. And you don't get as much of that in CVP, because in the OR, you see them in the beginning, you get to know about their case, you get to briefly speak to them, and then you, and then you start the surgery of, for which they're um, under anesthesia. And if you're working in a bigger center that has the ICU component, they're very ill. If you are taking care of them as a perfusionist in the ICU, they are very ill and unlikely to be communicating with you. So you have to communicate with family sometimes, but if that's very important to you, then CVP is not that specialty. I think that's fair. Yeah. Amazing. So I think it was Irene who asked that question. So congratulations. You got like the entire panel <laughs> to have a discussion <laughs> of one question. That was great. Yeah. Okay. So unfortunately, I do have to move on because we are like way over time. Um, but thank you so much to everyone who contributed to that answer. That was great. And thank you, Irene, for asking that very thought-provoking question. Um, so with that, uh, I did just want to wrap up quickly. Um, so we are doing some sessions they are called Ask Me Sessions. So if you didn't have your question answered today, we are having these sessions every Wednesday, 1 to 2 p.m. until February the 9th. They will stop and then they will resume in April. And that will be with our lovely admissions team. They can answer any questions you may have about the application, the admission requirements, all of that good stuff. And we also do have two upcoming information sessions next week one on the Wednesday for the full-time programs and one on the Thursday for the part-time programs. That is also with our incredible admissions team. And then of course, if you have any questions and you can't wait for those information sessions, feel free to email us at admissions at .ca. This inbox is monitored by our incredible admissions team, monitored by me sometimes, and we will do our best to answer any questions you may have about any of our programs. And with that, thank you so much to everyone for coming. Thank you to our amazing panelists for answering all of the great questions, for giving your insights in the profession, on the programs, and have a lovely evening. And hopefully we'll see you maybe at our other virtual programming sessions. All right, everyone. Take care. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Good luck, everyone. <laughs>